Welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Sherry Meyerhofer and I am the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, let's give people a moment to join the webinar and then we'll get started. Uh, while we're waiting, please feel free um, as people are logging on to mention in the chat where you're joining from. Um, I can see from the registration list that we have more than 300 people joining from over 46 countries around the world, spanning all regions. So I wanna thank, thank um, in advance to those of you who are joining us from places that require getting up early or where this is cutting into your downtime. Um, once again, good morning, afternoon and evening to those of you joining us from around the world. My name is Sherry Meyerhofer and I am the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise or the CORE as my office is referred to. I would like to begin today's webinar by acknowledging that the land from which I am joining you today and where the Office of the Corps is located is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. My team and I recognize and are grateful for the protection and care for this land by the Algonquin people. We respect and affirm the rights of Indigenous peoples everywhere and are committed to reconciliation, including through our work. I am happy to welcome you to today's webinar, which is featured alongside of a full program of interesting side sessions during the OECD's ninth annual forum on due diligence in the garment and footwear sector. We are very grateful to the OECD for providing us with this platform. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the core, my office was established in 2019 by the Canadian government to help groups negatively impacted by business operations access remedy as outlined under pillar three of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights or the UNGPs. The core has a mandate to promote respect for human rights and responsible business conduct with Canadian companies operating outside of Canada in the garment, mining and oil and gas sectors. In addition to our efforts to promote the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, the Corps has a complaint mechanism through which impacted individuals and groups can submit complaints to the Corps about possible human rights abuses that have resulted from the overseas operations of Canadian companies in our three sectors. We work with complainants and Canadian companies to try and resolve disputes and seek remedy for harms that may have resulted. Last month, World Vision Canada published a supply chain risk report that lists the goods being imported into Canada at risk of being produced through child labor by Canadian companies and their supply chains. That report found that Canada is increasingly importing more goods at high risk of being made with child labor. And among the high risk goods identified, garments were listed as second out of a total of 98 risky goods, and that's based on import value in 2021. It's an important statistic to share as it indicates more needs to be done to address the risk of child labor in Canada's garment sector. The World Vision study and the study that the Corps has just published are complementary and provide a broad perspective on the risk of child labor in the operations of Canadian garment companies. For the core study, we spoke to 10 Canadian garment companies and asked them about the risk of child labor in their operations and supply chains, as well as about what steps they were taking to address these risks. Those of you who, that are familiar with the Canadian context will know there has been increasing discussion in Canada about the need for mandatory human rights due diligence legislation to strengthen corporate responsibility and accountability for human rights. This of course mirrors the discussions that are taking place in Europe and elsewhere. And we hope that today's discussion and the core study will contribute to these efforts. I am therefore very much looking forward to moderating this discussion and hearing from our esteemed panelists who I will introduce in a moment. The format of this webinar includes the introduction of the panelists, followed by a short presentation by my colleague, Danielle Bennett, um, on the main results and recommendations of the core study. I'll then moderate a discussion with our panelists, after which we'll open up for questions from our audience. For those of you in the audience, 
please feel free at any time to include questions for either myself or the other panelists in the Q&A. So without further ado, I would now like to introduce our panelists. Joining us from Denmark is Catherine Block Viber, who is a senior advisor on business and human rights at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. She has over a decade of experience collaborating with companies to address human rights concerns in their global value chains. Catherine uh, currently oversees the Responsible Value Chains Program at the Institute, which aims to support and advance responsible business practices in global value chains. Next, we have Malin Liegert, who is a Director of Child Rights in Business Global Cons Consultancy Services, the Center for Child Rights in Business. She has over a decade of experience providing expertise to business clients, public sector partners, and other st stakeholders. She has a deep understanding of international human rights discourse, environmental, social, and corporate uh, governance policies. Malin is based in New York. Based in Toronto is Kelly Drennan, who founded Fashion Takes Action in 2007 to create a more sustainable future for the entire fashion system, that is for both industry and con consumers. She works to remove barriers to sustainability through a number of programs and events, including the annual World Ethical Apparel Roundtable, or WEAR as it's commonly uh, known, which covers a wide, wide range of topics from living wage and gender equality to textile recycling and material innovation. Kelly co-created a sustainable fashion uh, toolkit for the industry with hundreds of global resources and advises government on textile related issues. And last but not least, we have the CORE's very own Danielle Bennett, a business and human rights analyst and the project lead for the CORE's study on child rights and the risk of child labor in the global operations of Canadian garment companies. Danielle has spent several years engaged in project implementation and research on business and human rights, specifically in the garment and mining sectors. Danielle is also a licensed lawyer in the province of Ontario and practices in the area of civil litigation. I will now hand it over to Danielle who will start us off with a brief presentation on the results of the core study. Danielle, over to you. Thanks, Sherry. Um, and I will apologize off the top to everyone if you can hear my dog barking in the background who insists he wants to be part of the presentation. So I'll just wait for the slides to be brought up here. All right. So, Welcome everyone. It's great to have you all here. And I'm very pleased to be presenting a high level overview of what you'll find in course study on respect for child rights and the risk of child labor in the global operations and supply chains of Canadian garment companies. Uh, our report was published last week uh, and you can find the link to it in the chat in English, French and Spanish if you'd like to take a look at that. Uh, turning now uh, to the agenda for today, I just want to set out a roadmap kind of, of where we're going to go. I want to take you through a bit of the background of the study, so the objectives, the methodology, who our respondents who participated in the study were, and then I'll take you through a few of the interview highlights and commentary from the report. And then finally, I'll just close off with the, a brief introduction to the recommendations that are also included in the report. And then, of course, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Sherry at the end of that so that we can get started on our discussion with the panelists. So looking at our uh, study objectives, we had a purpose overall to assess the Canadian garment company, Canadian garment company approaches uh, to child rights uh, and addressing the risk of child labor in their global operations and supply chains. And so we had three main objectives that we wanted to um, that we wanted to hit. The first was to gather data uh, in order to better understand uh, the experiences of Canadian garment companies. We, of course, wanted to, from that, identify any challenges and opportunities that uh, garment companies might be facing, particularly with respect to supply chain transparency and human rights due diligence uh, as they relate to child rights. And then finally, using that data and the challenges and opportunities that we identified, we wanted the study to serve as a resource in order to strengthen supply chain transparency uh, and human rights due diligence, or HRDD, um, and again, with respect to child rights. 
So if we look at the methodology for the report, we contracted Nanos Research, which is a public interest research company in Canada, to conduct confidential interviews with Canadian garment companies. And a total of 208 companies were identified through public and private databases. Uh, and so we, we identified those based on factors such as annual revenues or number of employees. Um, and then Nanos ultimately conducted a total of 10 interviews. And they were asked a series of questions uh, that we developed in consultation with our subject matter experts. And I'll just note here, because I likely will fall into the habit of referring to the, um, the companies that we interviewed. And by that, uh, I don't mean to suggest that the core conducted the interviews. I just want to reiterate, it was Nanos who conducted them confidentially and anonymous to the core as well. However, the core did conduct in-house uh, confidential interviews with five civil society organizations as well. And then our subject matter experts, of course, are the Danish Institute for Human Rights and the Center for Child Rights and Business. And as you heard from Sherry, we have uh, rep representatives from both of those organizations here today. So turning uh, to the profile of who participated in the study with respect to garment companies, uh, we had four respondents who were considered small enterprises, so 1 to 99 employees with global revenue ranges between 10 million and 100 million. And then we had two respondents uh, who would be considered medium-sized enterprises, so 100 to 499 employees. One of those respondents had a global revenue range under 10 million, while the other had a revenue range between 10 million and 100 million. And then finally, you'll see we had four respondents who would be considered large enterprises with 500 plus employees. And all four of those respondents had re uh, global revenue ranges uh, over 100 million. So you can see here, um, we do have quite a good representation in terms of small and medium sized enterprises or SMEs um, with, with those SMEs making up the majority of the companies who participated. Uh, and in terms of where these countries operate in the world, um, I've got a map here just identifying the top 10 countries um, where the participating companies uh, are operating. And that's based on the number of respondents who indicated that they operate in, in that particular country. I'll just, um, I'll just highlight two, the top two, uh, the first one being China. So all 10 of the participating countries operate um, in that country. And then the United States, um, eight out of the 10 uh, companies who participated operate um, in the US. Um, and of course you can find the full list in the report if you'd like to take a look at that um, as well. So turning next to our civil society organizations who participated, we had two Canadian CSOs and three international CSOs who also uh, participated. Now I'll turn over with that in mind, all that background in mind, I'll turn over to the interview highlights and commentary. So I have seven that I wanna take you through, um, but just before doing that, I do wanna note that uh, being that our study uh, was conducted with 10 uh, interview participants, we don't generalize to the garment sector as a whole from this. Um, so really we're looking at the interview results as pointers or as indicators to where Canadian garment companies uh, might strengthen their efforts and what we could do to help them. So just keep that in mind as we're going through each of the highlights. So I'll take you to the first highlight now. And that is that we found there was a limited understanding of key responsible business conduct or RBC concepts. Um, so just a few examples of these. The first one, we found that um, when asked about child labor, only one of the companies mentioned the right to education. So, of course, uh, education is a key right for children, and it is, in fact, central to the definition of child labor. As a second example, we found that some companies uh, seem to mistakenly view social compliance audits as being equivalent to human rights due diligence. And HRDD, um, as I'll refer to it throughout the presentation, is a distinct process. It's intended to help companies identify and assess human rights risks and impacts, as I'm sure you, you all may be aware and then prevent, mitigate, and remediate those risks and impacts. 
And then finally, we found that only half of the companies, so five out of 10 interviewed, are familiar with the United Nations guiding principles and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Uh, the second interview highlight that I'd like to draw your attention to um, is this, uh, the, the issue of traceability. So many of the companies found uh, tracing uh, garments at lower tiers or lower production levels uh, to be particularly challenging. Um, and so we asked the companies how often they trace garments from origin to consumer. Um, and we learned that actually less than half or four of the 10 companies uh, regularly trace garments and two of those four are SMEs. So we followed that up by asking to what level of production they trace garments and those that do tend to focus on the later stages of production. So here I'm referring to tier one or tier, uh, tier two, as you can see on the graphic, which are garment production and fabric production. Um, in fact, only two trace garments to the fourth level of production are raw materials. And uh, one of those is an SME. And so when we asked what some of the challenges companies faced, um, if you could just flip back to the earlier slide. Perfect, thank you. So some of the challenges that companies uh, raised regarding improving garment tracing uh, include in no particular order uh, that they lack resources for tracing, um, that tracing at the lowest levels of production is, so raw materials is actually quite difficult. Uh, and then also that suppliers did not provide accurate information in many instances, which also made tracing difficult. So I'll turn now to the third, um, the third interview highlight that I'd like to point out, and that is a limited understanding of human rights due diligence. I hinted at this at the, at the outset, um, but a majority of the companies interviewed, so seven of them stated that they regularly conduct human rights due diligence, and three of those are SMEs. Um, but when we asked other interview questions, it seemed to suggest that they, those companies did not have an in-depth understanding of HRDD. So just uh, two examples of this, um, six of the 10 companies interviewed stated that they were unaware of any child labor risks. Uh, and yet four of those six also stated that they conduct human rights due diligence. And as I mentioned initially, the first step of human rights due diligence involves identifying and assessing human rights risks and impacts. Um, so there may be a bit of a disconnect um, in what companies understand HRDD to be. And then I also mentioned a few slides back that some companies incorrectly view social compliance audits as being equivalent to HRDD, when in fact they're quite distinct processes. And then as you'll see here, our fourth interview highlight um, is uh, something that I have already just touched on, uh, but I do think deserves its own, its, own, um, its own mention, and that is this limited awareness of child labor risks and impacts. And so, as I previously stated, most or six of the participating Canadian government companies were not aware of any risks regarding the use of child labor in their operations and supply chains. And... Um, You'll know, if you recall, oh, you could just flip back to the prior slide. You'll note from the earlier slide of the map um, that, in fact, many of the companies operate in high-risk regions. So based on global the statistics from global institutions or the Department of the U.S. Department of Labor, we do know that um, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific regions tend to be higher risk, although not exclusively, of course. Um, and many of the companies do many of the companies interviewed do operate in those regions. So I did mention off the top as well that all 10 of the companies operate in China by way of one example. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous slide as well, we found that most of the companies stated that they conduct human rights due diligence, which of course, if done properly, would involve identifying child labor risks uh, in, operation, in their operations and supply chains. So turning to the next uh, interview highlight, we found, in fact, there were few confirmed cases of child labor. So we had only two of the participating Canadian garment companies experienced a confirmed case of child labor in their operations and supply chains. Um, but we know that 
it's likely the, the number of cases could be higher if supply chain transparency was improved. And that's particularly the case in high risk regions and at lower levels of the supply chain. And participating civil society organizations that we interviewed stated that if garment companies uh, do not identify child labor within their operations, it's likely because the company does not have full visibility uh, over every tier in its supply chain. And certainly, I think this could be true for the companies that participated in the study, given that only two of the companies that conduct human rights due diligence do so at the fourth level or the fourth tier of production, which is raw materials. And of course, this is where child labor risks tend to be higher or more prevalent. So I'll turn to um, the sixth interview highlight. And this is that we noticed a heavy reliance on compliance and monitoring tools. So this is probably unsurprising at this point, as I have mentioned that companies uh, seem to conflate social compliance audits and HRDD. Um, as there is a very heavy reliance on social audits, um, supplier codes of conduct, sort of other monitoring and compliance tools to identify, assess, and also address the risk of child labor. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more in the, in the panel discussion, but of course there are other more comprehensive approaches that could help a company identify and address child labor, such as um, ensuring long-term and equitable relationships with suppliers, uh, implementing training programs throughout the supply chain. Those are just two examples, um, uh, but we'll hear more about that from our panelists. And then the seventh interview highlight I want to draw your attention to is this tendency towards uh, zero tolerance approaches to child labor. So we found, um, well, just to, to note first here, a zero tolerance approach, of course, means the termination of a supplier relationship when an instance of child labor is discovered. And we found that one of the companies interviewed uh, who did experience a confirmed case of child labor indicated that they stopped working with that supplier. And in fact, other companies that, we, that uh, participated also say, stated that they would take a similar approach if child labor was discovered in their supply chains. Um, and of course, terminating a supplier uh, relationship is, 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 can be necessary at, at, some, at some points, but we would just uh, suggest that this should be an option of last resort. Um, and again, our panelists can get into some of the reasons why this might be and what companies should do in the alternative. So those are the seven highlights that I wanted to draw your attention to and just briefly overview. Of course, you can find uh, all of them in greater detail in the study. Um, but I'll turn now uh, just to end off uh, on the recommendations, and I just want to very briefly go, go over the five recommendations that you'll find in the report. So the first one um, is to use the regulatory power under Canada's Bill S-211 to make regulations requiring transparency at lower tiers. So um, Bill S-211 is, is similar to the UK or, or Australia's Modern Slavery Acts. Um, it's very likely to pass into law soon. Um, and we've chosen this recommendation really because uh, the success of any legislative initiative and certainly Bill S-211, which is aimed at addressing child labor, really depends on how effective Canadian companies, Canadian garment companies are at enhancing transparency beyond the first tier of production, garment production, um, where of course, um, child labor is known uh, to be greater being the further down the supply chain. And then our second recommendation that we've included in the report is to adopt mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. Uh, this is a recommendation that we have put forward before, so it's not new, but we do reiterate it in the study because we, we do believe that Canadian garment companies need to implement effective HREDD policies and practices in order to successfully address uh, human rights risks and impacts, including the risk of child labor, of course, um, and, in, and to provide remedy. Uh, and they should do that throughout their supply chains from garment production to raw materials production. And then the third recommendation we've included in the report is to include standards that go beyond garment production, so tier one um, of a company's supply chains um, within the RBC standard that's been announced in Canada's revised RBC strategy. 
So the new RBC strategy envisions the development of a, of a reporting standard. Um, and so really here we've included this recommendation because we don't believe companies, garment companies need to wait for legislative measures in order to take action. Of course they can and they should take steps now in order to enhance transparency uh, within their supply chains and having this standard um, will be integral to doing that. And then the fourth uh, recommendation that we've put forward is to expand approaches to child labor remediation. Um, I mentioned as one of the last interview highlights, there is a zero tolerance approach. Um, and so um, this recommendation is really aimed um, at that. And of course, as supply chain transparency increases, particularly at lower tiers, Canadian garment companies are really going to, well, they're likely going to identify more cases of child labor. And so they're going to need uh, effective child labor remediation mechanisms in place um, in order to address um, those instances. And of course, one that only terminates the supplier relationship as a matter of last resort. And then our fifth and final, final uh, recommendation that we've included, um, it's per perhaps not the sexiest recommendation, but something that we think is very important. And that is that Canadian, Canadian garment companies really need to strengthen their knowledge of key RBC um, or business and human rights concepts which of course includes child rights and child labor. Um, and this is important um, for obvious reasons, I'm sure, but in order to meet obligations under any new legislation, or in fact, for those legislative and policy measures to be most effective, Canadian government companies are really going to require a stronger understanding of responsible business conduct key, key concepts. So that is a very quick summary of the recommendations that you'll find in the report. And again, like the interview highlights, you can um, find the full details in the study report itself. Um, so that concludes this portion of the presentation. I'll turn it back over to Sherry to kickstart our panel discussion. Great. Thank you very much, Danielle, for your excellent presentation. Um, as, as mentioned, it's now time to bring in our other panelists to discuss the report's ob observations and results and go dig a little deeper. So to place the uh, report in context, I'm gonna direct my first question to Kelly. Um, Kelly, to what extent do you think the responses from the 10 participating Canadian garment companies are representative of the Canadian garment sector as a whole? And do you think Canadian garment companies face similar challenges and opportunities? Great. Well, thank you so much for having me join this important discussion today. And I, I should, however, make it clear that I am no expert on human rights, especially compared to my esteemed fellow panelists. So um, I do hope to provide some Canadian context to today's discussion and some insights into potential challenges and opportunities for implementing HRDD. Um, first thing that I should mention, though, is that over the past couple of months, we've been you know, meeting with several Canadian apparel brands to discuss their priorities for the year or the next few years. And we do this regularly. And, and over the past few years, climate and circularity were always at the top of the list. Um, and while the, those are still a priority for most brands, because of this impending legislation, we're, st we're starting to see that human rights is now becoming a priority. However, the sustainability teams in Canada tend to be small, with the exception of a couple brands. So it, it often means that all of these priority areas fall in the hands of just one or two people. Some brands still don't even have a designated person in the role of sustainability. So it's work that's being done off the side of a desk. Um, and that really makes it challenging for the brands to get anything meaningful done in a reasonably short time frame. So having said that, the conversations that we are having with brands around human rights is definitely in line with the results of your study. Um, and so I guess to finally answer your question, yes, I do believe it is representative of the garment sector here as a whole, with again, the exception of um, a couple of brands. I would just go on to say that of the seven highlights that you outlined in your report, that we hear most often, traceability is the greatest challenge. So I was actually surprised to see four out of 10 interviewed, like I thought that was high, um, that have that visibility and that two were even able to trace back to tier four. Um, because from what we understand that there's really no visibility beyond tier one. Um, 
And then I guess the second most common would be that the social the reliance on social audits and codes of conduct um, to assess compliance. And you know, many actually believe that this is an effective enough solution. Um, and I do think that that comes back to the other point of your study, which is the lack of understanding and knowledge um, that the industry has here with respect to this topic. Great, thank you, Kelly, for setting the context. That's, I think that's really important to get our, our conversation started. Um, so I'd now like to focus on supply chain transparency, move into this, this topic. And my first question here is going to be to all panelists. And I'm just going to ask the panelists to respond in alphabetical order by first name. So Catherine, Danielle, Kelly, and then Malin. So the question is to everyone, what can and should Canadian companies be doing to prepare themselves for the arrival of supply chain um, transparency legislation? So Catherine, first, first to you. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for inviting me to uh, be a part of this panel here today. Um, so, yes, I think um, Kelly um, touched upon it when she was mentioning the need for increasing capacity, uh, both in terms of having uh, the people in place within um, the companies that have a clear uh, mandate to do this work and not just at the side of a desk, as Kelly mentioned, um, but also that they have the the needed knowledge um, in terms of, of an overview of what are uh, the various tools, resources available to them in uh, conducting uh, this work. Um, and there, of course, the OECD due diligence guidance on uh, supply chain um, management in garment and footwear is a quite a good resource. There are a number of other good resources out there which try to kind of speak specifically to industry actors about how to get a better understanding of what are some of the, the human rights challenges in um, in the supply chain. Um, then it's also about being able to ask the right questions. And I'll get back to that with my next intervention, but really um, going beyond just looking at kind of quality and price and engagement with um, suppliers, um, but also uh, trying to have a better understanding of, you know, where are they located? What could be some of the risks associated with that uh, specific location um, and having that uh, dialogue. So start asking those questions and having that dialogue with suppliers. Uh, on different uh, aspects than just on quality and price. Great, thanks, Catherine. Danielle, over to you. You know what, Sherry, I'm actually gonna just let our other panelists um, take on these questions uh, directed at, at all of us and I'll just pipe in here and there where I find um, a relevant remark to add. Okay, so if you wanna jump in at the end after they go, that would be Certainly. great. Thanks, Danielle. Kelly? Um, sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> the bigger the brand, the harder this is, right? And the longer it's going to take. So action definitely needs to be taken immediately, given that the clock is ticking here. Um, ideally, the brand would own some part of the supply chain, which does allow for more control and visibility, but that's really like rare for Canadian brands. Um, so I guess just, I mean, a few uh, obvious steps um, would be to uh, you know, looking at going beyond an audit, um, possibly adding in uh, human rights impact assessments, um, coming back to this idea of stronger relationships, uh, long-term relationships with suppliers, ones that are based on trust um, and respect and that are less transactional, right? Typically buyers, <clears throat> buyers uh, feel that suppliers lack initiative and suppliers feel that buyers lack commitment. Um, so that shift has to happen from that traditional command and control mindset to more uh, collaborative and open relationships and that brands can view their supply chain uh, as value adding partners, partnerships. Um, and then I guess just the tracing piece, right? Like getting back to tier four and then publishing that on the website. I just thought it, this would be an interesting point to mention um, for some context that Gildan is the only Canadian brand that ranked in the top percentage in Fashion Revolution's latest transparency index. Um, and then Lululemon wasn't that far behind. So just to, again, bring that sort of um, Canadian perspective to where we are at with respect to transparency. Great, thanks, Kelly. Malin, just to wrap up that question. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks also, Sherry, and the whole uh, core team for inviting me uh, joining today. And also congratulations on a great report. Yes, there are not so many companies that are interviewed, but I think it's really what came out of these interviews is really, really interesting. And I think you have been 
doing some great work in sort of taking out a lot of learnings from, from the CGVs. Okay, so coming back to what can Canadian companies do to prepare themselves? Well, it can be a little bit overwhelming, uh, can understand, but I think also that companies should now be a little bit smart and think about what's out there already, right? Because we have a lot of reports, we have a lot of information, then we have all these tools, the OECD guidelines, the UN guiding principles, it's a lot of information. But I would also suggest that starting to, to understand and create, uh, create visibility into your supply chain. And we have already talked about this a little bit, but if you are sourcing from a country where there is a high risk for child labor, and this is, I mean, there are a lot of reports out there. And if it is a country with a lot of school dropouts, where you have a lot of poverty, then that, that's a high risk for child labor. So you don't have to start and look at every single uh, supplier right now, but start to sort of understand where you're sourcing from, where are the high risk countries or even areas. There are reports also about that, even going down to that level. So, so uh, create visibility, act on the public information that you have, start creating, start thinking about, okay, where are our high risk areas and what do we need to address that to start with? I think that's sort of key. Thank you, Nalan. Um, Kelly, I think you've already answered my second question. So if, if I have just uh, just say a confirm, but that I was going to ask uh, to the extent you think increasing supply chain transparency throughout the garment chain is on the radar, radar Canadian garment brands and companies. You, you mentioned um, some standing in the, um, the fashion revolution and, and a couple of Canadian companies. Was there anything else you wanted to add on that? Well, I mean, I would say that it's on the radar for, you know, probably like 75% of the brands that are here. Um, it's just a far lower number that are actually taking action. And again, it's not because they don't want to, right? It's just rather because they have the limited resources, the small teams or no designated person on sourcing or social compliance. And I think there's a big sort of sense of overwhelm about just where to start. And so the folks that we do speak with know that traceability is really the only way to increase transparency. I guess cost is also, um, I know another factor, right? It's uh, it's challenging, right, for those tasked with this job to convince the decision makers to invest in traceability tools, um, and oftentimes that comes down to that lack of understanding of the importance of the issue, and therefore, I guess their ability or capacity to voice the urgent need. Um, so, yeah, I mean, company-wide buy-in and um, common understanding is a really good first step, but brands have to invest in this or else they run the risk of being non-compliant non -compliant in so many areas. Great, yeah, uh, good, uh, good additional information there. Um, so my third and final question on supply chain transparency is for uh, you, Catherine. Um, what do you see as some of the challenges to increasing supply chain transparency, particularly for fiber or raw material suppliers? And what are some of the ways companies in other jurisdictions have effectively addressed the issue. Thank you for that question. Yeah, as I see it, there are kind of three um, uh, main challenges. Um, and part of that is also what I mentioned before. Um, so the first one is really not asking uh, the questions to suppliers. So who are your sub suppliers? <laughs> um, and just to mention an anecdote from uh, which was part of a project that was done under um, the Danish fashion and textile industry project to kind of look at their uh, transparency in their supply chain, uh, which preceded some work that we did with them on human rights due diligence. Um, they had one of the companies had um, had a look at their uh, suppliers and focusing, uh, as we also saw with this study, primarily, of course, on their finishing kind of uh, first tier suppliers um, and uh, identified that all of their suppliers were based in Turkey and that kind of gave them a risk picture around Turkey. Um, but through this project, they were asked to then ask the suppliers, do you do any subcontracting? And what they identified was actually that a large part of their production was subcontracted to a factory that was based in Bangladesh, which of course gives a whole different picture uh, of, of the risks also when it comes to specifically around child labor. Um, so the, the, the key challenge here for my first point is really, you know, the need to, to ask the questions, because if you don't know, you don't know your risk picture and the impacts and you can't actually take action. So you actually miss out on risks and how to address them. Um, the second point is um, not going 
uh, beyond the first tier. So as I mentioned with this anecdote, it's really covering the first tier because that's what's more most closely connected to you as a company. That's kind of the, the tier that you can see that you engage with um, on a daily level as well um, as it relates to uh, them providing you with the, the garments. Um, so it doesn't really cover the lower commodity tiers and there it's also a, a about asking the question of your first tier suppliers, where do the different elements come from and set expectations in terms of the type of, uh, of performance that you'd like to see in those lower uh, supply tiers. And then thirdly, um, it's about uh, identifying and engaging with relevant initiatives. Um, so here, um, when it comes to the lowest tiers, um, of course, you know, if you are a brand and you're producing a a, a, a cotton t-shirt, um, there's only a certain amount of cotton that goes into that. But if you uh, work together with other brands that are also uh, purchasing cotton uh, and are a part of a cotton initiative to ensure better working conditions within the cotton uh, industry, then you can have much more influence and leverage in order to move things forward. Um, so you can do it alone, but you know it's also better to do it together in order to increase that leverage. And then when it comes to kind of um, the question that you had around uh, different jurisdictions, of course, right now we're seeing, uh, it was already mentioned in the beginning, but uh, the emergence of various mandatory human rights due diligence legislations focusing specifically on forced labor or on child labor or more broadly on the need to conduct uh, human rights due diligence processes, so to identify, assess, and address human rights impacts um, across operations, including in the supply chain. Um, and here there is really a need to both be able to know and show that you respect human rights across your supply chain. Um, and that demand is just going to grow. So it's really just, you know, a call for um, for Canadian and other garment uh, industry actors to understand that, you know, this is something that uh, you need to be prepared for and is possible uh, to achieve by asking the right questions, by working together uh, to achieve change. Great. Thanks, Catherine. I don't know if you uh, knew it, but you, you did respond to one of the, the questions that were put in the Q&As about collective action. Um, so thank you very much for that. It was timely in response to that question. And we can loop back to talk a little bit about that more maybe at the very end. Um, but uh, thanks for doing that in real time. And I hope that um, addressed the audience members um, question, uh, at least to, to some extent. And we can always circle back to it, as I said. So interesting discussion on supply chain transparency. And I just want to thank all the panelists uh, for your, your contributions. Um, and a thank you to the audience members for putting in, in questions as we go along. And we can, uh, we'll take a lot more of these at, at the end of, after um, we finish with our, our, our questions. So um, I wanna move now to uh, compare and discuss the topics of social audits versus human rights um, impact assessments. And Catherine, again, my first question is to you. Um, and it is, should companies shift from using audits to human rights impact assessments or should they do both? Well, um, as Danielle mentioned, you know, companies are expected to respect human rights, which requires human rights due diligence. That means identifying, assessing, addressing actual potential human rights impacts. And in order to do so, a different mix of, of tools and resources need to be applied. Um, and social audits can be a part of that picture, but not the full one. So that would be my kind of initial answer to that first question. Okay. Uh and then, so um, what are we acting, asking companies to do in practice then? Um, and what are the practical impl implications in terms of resources? Yeah, so just to say in terms of like um, social audits, um, there are many shortcomings identified in connection to that. Uh, I think first and most importantly, social audits are um, by many suppliers viewed as a way to gain access to buyers, right, to gain access to markets. Um, it's not uh, necessarily viewed by them as a tool for them to improve their human rights performance uh, or uh, become more um, respect human rights. Um, so some of the key challenges that are associated with, um, with social audits also include that um, they often are done with very short uh, timelines. Um, they uh, 
don't necessarily have the right level of human rights specific expertise within the group of auditors who are conducting uh, these audits. Um, not necessarily trained in human rights may come from more of an environmental background and not maybe be able to identify and, and look at the specific human rights challenges. Um, then the benchmark um, is not always international human rights. It's often uh, local uh, law as well as uh, the company's own codes. And there, of course, there's a certain level of interpretation as to how and to what extent they, they align with, uh, with international human rights. Um, but human rights impact assessments uh, cannot fully replace uh, audits, but they are a different tool that can be used um, by companies who want to better understand uh, the human rights specific challenges associated with uh, specific countries of, um, uh, of uh, activity, uh, as well as specific issues. And I'm sure uh, colleagues will also speak to child rights impact assessments and what they can uh, provide of, of input. Um, but they also uh, require quite a few things. So of course it takes time it takes financial resources to conduct uh, human rights impact assessments. It takes um, expertise. You need to, um, and we would recommend uh, identifying external human rights expertise to support in the, such assessments. Um, it needs buy-in from the supplier, um, from the company itself, so all of the different parties involved. And it needs resourcing in terms of implementation and follow-up. So it's not enough to conduct the assessment, but the findings things need to be adequately resourced uh, in order to ensure that there is follow-up and accountability as to the extent to which the, the company and the supplier is meeting the, the results of the findings. Um, so uh, in a way you can look at the uh, human rights impact assessment as, as one uh, possible um, avenue for companies to pursue, um, which will provide a much more kind of detailed and in-depth picture from a human rights perspective. Um, it can be a great tool for larger companies, but for smaller companies, um, it can be a tool that can be used much more in a collective manner. So working together um, with uh, other uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to conduct uh, impact assessments um, on specific countries um, or specific types of uh, parts of the value chain um, to gain a deeper understanding of what can be done some more at the industry level or at a specific commodity level. Um, so, so they can really provide that uh, detailed and nuanced analysis uh, either in a standalone way for one company, but they're mainly for the larger companies, for the smaller companies, something that can be done collectively also through these uh, collective initiatives. Great, and thanks again, Catherine, for bringing in the collective aspect of that and responding to that uh, one of our audience members' questions. Um, um, Melin, a question for you. Um, what is the value in doing a child rights impact assessment over an audit or even a human rights um, um, audit more broad broadly? Yes, um, thank you. So I think they are complementary in one way. So one can say that an audit, for example, if we do an audit today, we will see what kind of uh, do we have child labor in a factory or at the supplier level today, right? If we do a human rights impact assessment or a child rights impact assessment, we will assess the risks for child labor tomorrow, next week, next month, because we go much more in, into depth about the risk factors, including the business practices. What, what business practices are impacting uh, child rights? And by child rights, we talk about child labor, but we also talk about maternity protection. We also talk about, so we also look at the elephant in the room, which is the wages, living wage. Do the parents that are working in the factory, do they earn enough? Or can we see that they need to go home and ask the kids to drop out of school and, and start to work? Maybe not in that supplier, but in another sort of business environment to support the family income. So uh, a child rights or human rights impact assessments, it's much more deeper. Uh, and we measure against another set of benchmarks that Catherine mentioned, the sort of international human rights uh, conventions. And I just want to also illustrate, so this morning we are doing currently uh, a child rights impact, or one can say actually a human rights impact analysis of cotton in Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, so that's really, now we're talking about traceability. Now we're talking really about sort of the lowest tier. So we are out there at farms and in villages. Uh, and then the, the difference here between an audit is that 
the kind of picture that I got this morning is a group of kids dancing and doing a warm up exercise because they are soon going to engage in a focus group discussion with the researchers there. So if we did an audit, we would have only gone to the, to the fields, um, see who's working there. Maybe no kids are working. But now instead we are sitting down with the kids, asking them about how do they do in school? What do they do in the past time? What do they want to become? Do they contribute? Do they work sometimes? Or what do they do in the spare time? So we get a much more comprehensive picture of the situation, which an audit of course cannot uh, sort of provide because that's a snapshot, right? But I also want to highlight, as, as Catherine also mentioned, that as we all know, that to sending a team up to northern Cote d'Ivoire and spend two weeks' time there in the cotton fields, in the markets, with the school, um, community leaders, uh, headmasters, and so forth, that, of course, takes an effort, costs money, resources, and so forth. But I think here it's, again, collective action, right? Because we know who are those that are sourcing from cotton from Cote d'Ivoire come together uh, do a human rights or child rights impact assessment jointly funded. But then also lastly, I just want to say that just doing human rights uh, impact assessment, child rights impact assessment, then it's not like just, okay, now we have done it. Now we sit back and relax, okay, for two more years. And then we, then we because we haven't seen anything. So it is a continuous effort, uh, but it can be done, uh, but it takes, takes a little bit more than an audit. Great, thanks, Amelin. Uh, so my final question in, in this uh, focus on uh, human rights impact assessments and so, uh, social audits um, is to both um, Melin and Kelly, but I'll start with you, Kelly. Why do you think companies um, ch uh, choose to do audits over human rights um, impact assessments? And how can we increase the uptake of human rights impact assessments? Well, I think audits are easy. It's what they know. Um, and without a real understanding, it's what they think does the job, right? Um, and sure, as, as it's been mentioned, audits can help to some extent in monitor, monitoring working conditions and flag where improvements or um, more steps need, need to be taken, but they just don't address the root cause. Um, and so, but I also think a human rights impact assessments um, are still new, right? And, and the benefits are, lesser known, um, so that then it comes back to sort of that education piece. Um, and as it's been mentioned, they come with a bigger investment, both money and time. And even to reiterate what Catherine said, it requires a deeper level of expertise. So um, what was the second part of your question? I feel like it's like, how do, how do we increase how, how can the uptake? We increase, how can we increase the uptake, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, is it is it effective and this is where i would defer to my panelists but to combine it really right with existing environmental assessments and take that integrated approach um as opposed to a standalone one and that could also alleviate some of that fatigue that the you know the suppliers are probably feeling in terms of um potential repeated consultation um yeah, so I think it really it's there's an education gap. I think that's the the first place that we need to start in Canada and um, and once once the brands know um, you know what they are and, and, and that's really a great first step. Yeah, great, thanks, Kelly. And of course, that's one of the rules of the the uh, the core is to raise awareness and to to um, provide advice and uh, some some guidance and direction. So that's great. Um, Malin, anything to add to that? Um, not really. I think we have discussed quite a bit around the you know, comparing uh, social audits and human rights impact assessment. But I think with, with stronger legislations also coming, then there will also be, I mean, there is no way out really for companies because they need to understand much better uh, their supply chain. They need to do uh, better and deeper supply chain management. So yeah, we will, and we are already seeing a lot of much more companies coming to us asking for advice on these issues that we didn't see, let's say five years ago, four years ago, not at all the same level of engagement with that. So that's a very good sign. So a little bit the carrot and the stick approach, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good sign um, um, that, that it's the trend is, is moving upwards. So yeah, thanks for that sort of insight. Um, so I'd now like to move to the final topic for discussion today, which is on remediation. Um, of course, you know, once you identify it, it doesn't matter if we don't if we don't address the problem, uh, it's all for naught. So, Malin, again, my first question is to you. When a garment company um, identifies cases of child labor, how should they deal with it? 
Um, okay, thank you, Sherry. And I'm also so happy that we are discussing remediation here because very often that's overlooked, right? You, you go to webinars and you talk about all the other parts of human rights due diligence and then the, the remediation is glossed over or skipped or we don't have time for that and so forth. And we, and we see that uh, more and more companies are coming also to us to discuss what do we do with remediation? So it is more of a sort of awareness around remediation because companies actually have uh, they must act on, on, on when they see adverse impacts of their uh, business operations uh, and they do harm, which child labor is, then they, they have the responsibility to engage in remediation process. And the remediation process can look at slightly differently depending on where we are uh, in the supply chain and in which country and so forth. But we have created from the center side a set of sort of uh, principles. What is a good remediation process and that should always be done with the best interest of the child in mind first of all because we're talking about children here so child rights uh, should go sort of is more important than the business uh, operations in this term and then it's about I mean the remediation the good remediation process actually starts earlier than when when a child labor uh, case is identified so I mean companies need to be aware of Child labor is existing everywhere. We are remediating child labor cases from the US to Indonesia, to China, to Bangladesh. Uh, so it's not only in sort of poor countries, it can happen everywhere because we have, we have also after the pandemic, we have a lot of more kids that have dropped out of school and we have also families whose income has been sort of been shattered. So the kids need to start working. So first of all, be honest and transparent about that. We have child rights, child labor risks here. What do we do? When we in, in uh, if we identify child labor, talk about this with your suppliers. Um, put down child labor uh, procedures and guidelines. Also discuss who's going to pay for the remediation, because this is something that we see quite often when we have a ca case of child labor. You need to usually act fast. In some countries, we have had children that have been taken out of child labor and been married away before we have been able to engage in a proper remediation process because simply the supplier and the brand are discussing at length we should pay for the remediation mm -hmm. and those things should of course be settled beforehand so have your child labor remediation procedures and guidelines in place uh, know what steps you're going to take and i mean here we are happy to support i don't want to go through these principles now but there are a number of principles that you can follow um, and engage also, as, as Catherine said, very often with third party organizations, experts on this, and not always think that your supplier can handle this or someone from our company can just go there and, and sort it out. It is, it is time consuming, it takes a lot of effort, but we all have a responsibility to do child labor remediation. There is no way out. And we can do it in all sorts of environments. So don't just say it's too complicated. It's still children, right, uh, working. and the conditions that they are working under is not like when I was moving the lawn of the neighbor when I was 12 years old. No, that's not really the kind of child labor that we see. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Very, very uh, excellent uh, response to that, uh, quite informative. Um, so moving to my final question um, in remediation and um, is that the study found that, the core study found that companies take a zero, zero tolerance approach to child labor um, that is, they stop working with a supplier if the risk um, or an actual case of child labor is found. And uh, Danielle mentioned a couple of times that the panel would talk about this in more depth um, as to um, if not a zero tolerance approach, what are the other what are the other options? So, um, Nalan, I'll just uh, stick with you on this, and then I'll I'll ask Kelly to follow up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again. I mean, yes, zero tolerance. We are against that. Uh, of course, we think that if you, if you stop your collaboration with the supplier, that doesn't mean that the issue of child rights risks or child labor is going away. You are just sort of saying this. Very often, companies panic and then they say, "Okay, but we have we have cut relationship with the suppliers. So it's all done." No, the risk is still there, right? The risk is still there for other children to start working for the supplier, or that this product problem is just being pushed down to another supplier in the same risk area, of course. So zero tolerance doesn't really help anything. You need to work with your suppliers and create engagement and create uh, 
yeah, create good relations. And I saw that there was one question coming through in the chat about how to how to create uh, good relations with the suppliers. And I just want to highlight that in case we will probably come back and talk a little bit about small, um, smaller, medium and companies. And we have said that it is challenging for them. But for example, we have a client, and I just wanted to bring that up, that is a small enterprise. They have three, three suppliers in China, right? That's very small. But still, they are every year investing around $10,000 in creating uh, worker well-being programs in the factories. They have managed to do impactful programs that is linked to the challenge that challenges that their workers are seeing. So they have managed to create a long-term, very stable relationship with their suppliers. And they are a small company. It's not a big one. It's not a sort of a big desk of sustainable yeah, uh, experts. So create good relationships with your suppliers. Uh, and don't just, you know, shop around and if we see something that is risky, we ditch them and then we go to another. That won't sort of, that's not helpful in the long run. Great, thank you. Uh, Kelly, um, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Malin really uh, covered it. Um, the fact that this should really be the last resort. I think why brands take this approach is, again, I think it comes back to a few things, lack of education, um, knowledge around the issue. Like some of them actually might think that this is the best course of action. Um, it's it's easy to, uh, it's cheaper and it's less time consuming, of course. Um, I think it's to, to Milan's point, you know, being prepared and proactive is the best um, approach, right? Rather than being reactive because it is something that you have to respond to immediately. Um, but also it came up earlier in the in the session around subcontracting, right? And this is where um, the zero tolerance approach can actually lead to more of that happening because the supplier is going to hide the problem. And um, so you'll start seeing subcontracting happening. And then I also just think, you know, coming back to this idea of collective action um, or the sort of collective impact approach um, is just a really great way for brands to consider addressing um, any real human rights violations in their supply chain. Like everybody's in the same boat. Um, you know, why not join forces and tackle these massive challenges together, right? It's, a, it's an approach that's already being taken to address circularity and waste. And more recently now we're seeing it with climate. So um, it's definitely time for the industry to seriously better collaborate and partner to address human rights. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. So that ends um, the, the sort of formal um, uh, part of our, our program. We're going to now move into audience Q and A. Um, I have I see six um, that have come in. Uh, the first question was about uh, collective action. We've talked uh, quite a bit about that. Um, if anybody wants to jump in and and say anything more about collective action, we can do that now. The and or the second question was about trust and Malin sort of. Um, uh, touched on that in her last response about you know the need to to build these relationships uh, with with the uh, uh, lower tier suppliers. So maybe if I could ask um, each of the panelists to talk a little bit, anything else you want to say about collective action in any aspect, and then also about the building of of relationships with uh, the the um, suppliers at the lower tiers. Um, Catherine, um, do do you want to speak to any either one of those question, questions? Um, yeah, maybe um, I could mention that, um, you know, now this analysis creates a really good foundation, I think, also for uh, Canadian garment companies to work together around uh, these challenges. Um, and just to, as I mentioned in, in the beginning of one of my interventions, um, uh, in, in Denmark, we've worked together with the Danish Fashion and Textile Industry Association to develop a, a human rights due diligence guide, um, looking at human rights issues across um, the value chain, not only focusing on child labor, but all different types of human rights impacts all the way from uh, procurement uh, and suppliers, uh, uh, raw materials to sales and marketing of, uh, of, um, of garment uh, products um, and fashion products. Um, and, um, and I can share in the chat a link to that, but I think what it showed was really because it was with a group of, of small and medium sized uh, companies that were involved there and really wanting to collectively create a better understanding of what are the challenges and what can we do. And the tool itself also refers to a lot of these various uh, collective initiatives that are available within specific parts of the value chain, as well as when it comes to specific commodities, especially in the raw materials 
materials uh, supply chain um, of garment companies. Um, uh, so yeah, including it in the chat as, as a resource, but also to say that that I think was very successful in creating some dialogue and, and creating learnings across uh, the group of companies that were involved in that, but also resulting in a public output, which can hopefully also influence others, uh, such as the report that we're, we're here to talk about here today, you know, lies the foundation also for having those types of discussions also um, at the Canadian industry level. Great, and but Catherine, um... Just thank you for that and putting that in the link. Um, it's something that uh, I know the core will be interested in, given that we are looking at a phase two. Um, and, and you know, I think maybe working with, a, you know, a, a number of ca uh, Canadian companies to do something collective, do something together uh, is one, uh, one of the very uh, possible um, um, modules or, or, um, that we would, would look at. So yeah, thank you for that. Anybody else on collective action or, or building trust and and that sort of the practicalities of of, of working with um, um, lower tier suppliers? Just jump in, anyone on the panel? Yeah, Sherry, just, <clears throat> just a few comments on sort of collective action, which I think is great. But I think also that sometimes companies then need to be able to share some of their business practices with other companies. And that's very often where it stops, right? Because we have a lot of discussions with companies in our working group, for example, about doing taking some collective action. But then it comes to we are not sure we can share our supplier list with them and we cannot disclose this and we cannot. So I think it's a little bit changing the mindset here if we are really going to, to achieve something when it comes to collective action, when we have sort of groups of companies come together. Then of course, there are a number of, of initiatives I saw on Quarry was coming uh, here in the, in the chat was mentioned and so forth. So there are a lot of sort of uh, industry associations and, and other ways uh, to also engage in sort of to common platforms doing that. But I think, yes, companies have to look inwards a little bit and see, okay, how can we contribute to collective, collective action? Can we be in the forefront and saying, okay, we are sharing the information that we have. We should we be one of those that are looking down and saying, hmm, this is tricky for us and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah, helpful, Melin. So that's maybe a, a two-step two, a two uh, phase two for CORE. Um, first, <laughs> getting people to look inward and then uh, getting them to work together. Thank you. That's a good point. Anyone else on, on those two topics? If not, I can um, move on. So the third question in here, <clears throat> and maybe I'll take a stab at it first, is, you know, why um, the focus on child labor? Um, you know, because, you know, child labor is one of many, many, you know, child rights or human rights that we could look at. And I just want to say um, from, the Canadian, from the Canadian perspective, it's because our transparency legislation focuses on forced labor and child labor. So we do know that Canadian companies, you know, need to be able to address this imminently. Um, they should be addressing all human rights all of the time, but you know this is something that that we can help prepare them for and to be able to do a good job at. Um, so all rights are are important, and of course, I also think that looking at um, child labor and and getting companies to do good practices around that will of course help them identify other human rights that apply you know, in child rights. So um, all is not lost. It's like the focus of the study was on that for. Um, you know, the Canadian context, but I think it is more broadly applicable. So anyone else want to um, take um, a stab at that or respond, you know, about child labor and why not the other ones? Um, I, sorry, go ahead, Captain. I was just going to add that, um, that we've seen an uptick in a, a great uptick in child labor uh, with the onset of COVID-19. And so certainly that played into our decision. Um, and I think as we've heard here too with our with our great panelists, like there are unique um, considerations with respect to child rights, maybe relative to, to forced labor to take into account. So those are just some other um, factors that went into the decision. Thanks, Daniel. Go ahead, Catherine. Sorry for cutting you off there. No, not at all. I was also just going to repeat what, what Marin said when she uh, mentioned that, of course, you know, when you're looking uh, with that lens on child labor, uh, all of the other types of, of labor rights impacts are, you know, if you have a poor performance in that area, it's quite indicative that you would also have challenges in, in other areas as well. So um, so just to, to highlight that point, which was already made that, you know, these uh, impacts tend to go hand in hand. And uh, if those types 
sorts of, of not misalignments with international standards and principles are there uh, when it comes specifically to children's rights. Uh, that is most likely an indication that other rights um, are also uh, being uh, impacted or neglected um, in that supplier. Great. So thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, any, anyone else on that question? I'm going to move on to um, a question on the topic of increased legislation. So here, here's the question. Do you see mandatory human rights due diligence having unintended consequences, such as divestment from smaller high-risk markets like cotton and cultivar? Um, and how can that be mitigated? Um, so I'm, I'm going to go to both Catherine and Malin on this because I think you've had some experience uh, in, in these markets. Should I start? Since I was the sure. one bringing up sure. cotton in cotton. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not yet, not so far. We haven't seen any divestment uh, as of yet. Um, I think this will take some time if it will ever happen. I think still the price is really one of the key factors here from where companies are sourcing. and. Uh, and, but what we can see, and which is very encouraging, that we have, for example, companies that are investing in a child rights impact assessment, human rights impact assessment in cotton, Northern Cote d'Ivoire on cotton. So that is, of course, sort of a result, but I don't think that the, whatever the, res, the result of strengthened legislations, but I don't think that whatever results that we will find in, in, our, in our research will sort of change, have them to change market. Not at all. I hope that it will uh, that will imply some improvement in business practices, perhaps whatever we find. But I don't think that, that this company will leave that market. And I think that goes for many of the sort of companies that are dealing with uh, sort of raw material and commodities, because also that we know that many of these commodities are sourced from. It's not a huge number of companies that countries where you can source cotton from, right, or where you can source um, other kind of raw material. Montes from so yeah great thanks Nina. anybody else on on uh, the, the, yeah. the impact of uh, increased legislation yeah I, I I would just add that I think um you know that there is there is some concern definitely expressed um not um so far that much around the mandatory human rights due diligence directive and those developments but also around kind of the forced labor ban and what that will mean in terms of of um, uh, actually you know not uh, getting access to market and development that's needed in order to improve uh, local human rights situations in uh, certain uh, markets and jurisdictions. Um, but there is but it could be an issue. And I think the issue stems from the fact that there may be a tradition um, in many uh, business to have this compliance culture. So you have your code of conduct and you have your audits. And in that way, you kind of secure yourself against um, human rights impacts. And there needs to be a certain level of shift. Um, and that's also what we're seeing in some of these um, uh, new uh, policy developments that um, instead of having that compliance uh, culture, there is kind of more of this reflective culture, knowing and showing uh, how you're addressing human rights, what are the challenges, etc. So there's an increasing expectation that it's not just about being able to tick the box, okay, child labor, no child labor, but actually being able to say, we've done the assessment, we did identify challenges around uh, child labor, um, and this is what we're doing about it, X, Y, Z, and we're trying to address it, and we're communicating about it. And that is what's going to kind of be an emphasis in the future, um, and what we're seeing coming through in the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive and in the Corporate Sustainable Reporting Directive here at the EU level, is this increasing emphasis on companies actually being better able to show their due diligence, human rights due diligence in practice. So what were the challenges? How did we address them? What came out of that process, et cetera? And that you know, needs to be the new culture in terms of how you're uh, complying with these legislative policies, not uh, just saying, oh no, we, we have it all in order because we have a code of conduct and we don't have any uh, child labor because that was identified through an audit, uh, which has uh, serious uh, limitations to it. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of maybe 
a part of the answer to the question that it also requires a bit of this shift in mindset. But if that doesn't happen, and if companies resort to more of this kind of compliance culture, and if the legislation isn't being transposed in a way and explained in a way which supports that process and gives value to that process, um, then then you could, of course, risk that that will happen again, you know. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think I'll, I'll move on um, to the next question. And we, there's been, I mean, we, a, a number, some of these things have been mentioned, but I think it, uh, I'll ask the question, it might be nice to sort of set them out, um, even though they've been mentioned before, some of them have. Um, the, the question is, could you please talk about some of the best practices and initiatives at the company or industry level to uphold human rights and minimize child labor? So just best practices, um, who'd like to take that one on first? I'll go. I mean, I think, you know, <clears throat> we've talked about it again. So just recapping this sort of stronger long-term relationships with suppliers, um, asking those questions, having those conversations, shifting that relationship uh, away from policing to being more of a partner. Um, I think that is is definitely best practice. And then just increasing transparency but you can't, if you, you know, if transparency is showing, uh, you can't show until you know. So, you know, traceability and transparency go hand in hand. Um, but I mean, again, the tools, the traceability tools are, you know, um, not in my wheelhouse, but that's definitely, I think, what's going to lead into the transparency piece. So supply relationships and transparency. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Anyone else on that list of uh, best practices? Yeah, maybe just um, to think about your own business practices, right? How are they impacting human rights? How are they impacting child rights? What, what, what do you do that can be sort of a positive um, take on this? Or what is it that you are doing that have a negative impact on that? And that might, might be that you need help in identifying that. But I think also that companies really have the responsibility to look also how are we sourcing um, when do we put our orders do we give them enough time uh, where do we put our orders and and what kind of relationship do we have with our with our suppliers have we start paying them more have we kept the same as just heard the other day have they kept the same price as they agreed upon for 15 years ago the specific markets they are keeping they they are paying the same price as 15 years ago and we all know that that's not really a responsible way of doing practices i think also take a look at at your at your business practices uh, that's important thanks Melin. and then uh, finally not to beat the collective action drama yet again um but just to say um uh, i've at least in the danish context seen seen some good examples of, um, of companies working together with, uh, for example, um, FSC, so the Forest Stewardship Council, to look at uh, their bamboo uh, supply chain um, and actually engaging with uh, the certification unit to actually go to the field, understand, you know, how is the production happening? Um, and through that, of course, both benefiting their own uh, sense of, of uh, Peace of mind when it comes to knowing, you know, where their raw materials come from, but also um, being able to uh, set a certain level of expectation also on um, on FSC uh, in terms of, you know, what are some of the uh, expectations in terms of, of uh, human rights uh, alignment and what would they be wanting to see in terms of the certification that they achieve through this initiative. Um, so, so just to say that, uh, that that's also an example, I think, of, of how this can be done in practice. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I'm going to, there is a question here about uh, whether companies should play a bigger role in child labor prevention through system strengthening. Um, <clears throat> in the sourcing regions. We, we have touched on that, I think, um, but if there is anything uh, additional, I mean, that you're in a region, it's, it's your company and it's, it's uh, not your country. Um, and, you know, there, there are certain, there's a certain local context. So what would be the role of the com company or companies there, um, I guess, to, to try to influence um, um, behavior of, of local uh, uh, companies, subcontractors? Yes, um, 
um, yes, of course, I think that the, the companies have a big role to play there. And uh, yes, you should have procedures, guidelines, policies in place, right? But then it's also very important, and I think that is what we see from the center side, right? Then it's also very important to take action when something happens and take the right action, because we can all do a lot of policy work, we can all have guidelines in place, we can all have uh, a lot of policies in place. But then when it happens, when we then suddenly have three kids working on a plantation and that company says, no, nah, it seems very complicated or we don't really know if the supplier, if, if it's his responsibility, then all these policies fall flat, right? Uh, so I feel that there is a lot of work, which is great, doing all this prepara preparatory work now, doing guidelines, doing uh, policies, but it's, it's really companies also need to take action when something happens. And uh, now I start to sound like an activist, uh, but, but I think that this is really also uh, the role of companies to not shy away from their impact that they are having and also not just say that this is the supplier's uh, responsibility because it's also the brand or the buyer that is sourcing and their business practices. Coming back to that, what is the impact of the business practices? Great, thanks, Mina. Good answer. Uh, anyone else wants to, to add to that? Maybe, maybe just to say that, you know, many of these challenges are more uh, systemic or maybe endemic or culturally uh, kind of a part of, of the local context. And in order to deal with it, you, you would need to um, engage with uh, partners at the local level. Um, so as you said, Sherry, you know, um, maybe not for an SME to take on by themselves, but collectively um, uh, the companies can, uh, can work together to engage with other uh, local organizations organizations, be that international organizations that have local offices such as the ILO or working with um, working with the uh, National Human Rights Institution at the local level who might have more insights into, you know, what are some of the challenges and who to reach out to uh, within, within the government, um, or also trying to uh, work with industry associations uh, and organizations at the local level. So there are several avenues that you can go, but of course, you know, you need to prioritize that and you need to view this as an opportunity to actually um, improve people's lives that are impacted by your operations. Um, and and that should be a part of the, the mindset and, and the drive behind uh, moving forward on this. Good, thanks, Catherine. Great responses from, from all. Um, I'm gonna move on to one, it's quite specific, and that's um, the panelist perspective on companies contracting organizations to conduct uh, human rights due diligence on their behalf. So um, contracting it out, that, that um, open it up to anybody to respond. I can uh, I can maybe uh, yeah. come with a response there. Um, yeah, I think um, I think. As I mentioned before, uh, conducting um, human rights impact assessments and child rights impact assessments do require a certain level of expertise and know-how. So I do think that you will need to have um, an expert organization to uh, support uh, in the process. But I, I also can see that um, there is a need for clear uh, ownership. I think I also mentioned that in my intervention uh, within the, the company itself conducting the assessment as well as uh, buy-in from uh, the supplier um, uh, involved. Um, so to, to some extent, it needs to happen in a collaboration, right? And it needs to be a close collaboration at the same time as securing the independence of the expert who is has been hired in. So of course they should have a certain uh, level of um, of uh, independence from uh, the company. But um, on the other hand, um, it's also important that the company is involved and has the insights in order to know what they then need to do in terms of follow-up and acting upon the findings that have been identified. Um, and of course, we have experiences from different industries on, on um, on this uh, effort, and uh, and it doesn't come without its challenges. But uh, but just to say that there is that kind of, um, and it needs to be some kind of balance between both 
being able to outsource, getting that external expertise, but also making sure that you still uh, feel ownership and buy-in and you actually get the knowledge that you need in order to then uh, be able to identify when do I need to conduct such an assessment in the future or where do I have similar situations where I may be able to apply some of the findings from this assessment. Great, thank you, Catherine. Anyone else on, on uh, using third parties to conduct your HRDD? Yeah, maybe I can just add to what Catherine said. I think it's definitely, I mean, good way of using uh, third party experts because I think very few companies have the time and the resources, but I, I agree that it needs to come with a certain level of ownership, but also that, that the company's thinking about, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this impact assessment. What are we going to do then? What is our next step? What are we going to do with the results? Because we have quite often companies that have very good intentions. We are coming with a report to them with a number of, of um, findings and also recommendations, mitigation, and then that report is put on a desk somewhere and we never get to sort of what can we do to mitigate the risks or corrective action or, or remediation. So I think also thinking through, uh, we are going to do this, but what are we also going to do afterwards when we get sort of uh, all the results? Um, so I think that's, that's also important. Good, that rounded that, that uh, response off quite nicely, Malin. Thank you for that. Um, I'm now gonna move on. There's two questions here that I'm going to put together and address to Kelly. Um, the first one is, um, are you able to share examples of best practice in Canada? And then the question that says, for Kelly, so Kelly, um, they're, they're asking you directly from the audience, what is the appetite of Canadian companies for sharing their supply chain data, um, which will be somewhat uh, required to comply with the upcoming legislation? Do they collect and analyze the data to understand labor practices in their global supply chain? So you may or may not have all that um, uh, internal um, uh, details, but uh, if you could just sort of the trends that you're seeing in talking to companies, um, just respond to those two questions. Yeah, I mean, most companies here are, you know, privately owned. Um, and I think, and what, we're, what I'm starting to see, well, there's definitely a reluctance to sharing data. And even when I've outside of the human rights conversation, let's say in circularity or in climate related discussions, um, I find the brands respond um, when we when we invite them to to have these kinds of conversations. Um, a lot of them say, you know, well, it really depends on who else is in the room, or you know, um, if it's a competitor, or you know, I'd have to check with legal and what I what I'm actually allowed to share. So I think even if they are actually, you know, doing collecting and analyzing the data themselves, in terms of that piece about sharing. Um, I definitely think that there is uh, a lot of hesitation and, and that actually ends up becoming quite a barrier um, to making progress in this area. So I'd like to see um, more sharing of information and more transparency just even amongst um, the industry itself. Um, again, that comes back to this whole idea of collective action and, and how can you work together um, if you really can't even understand where those sort of common um, challenges lie, if you're not ready, willing to share or disclose your supply chain. Um, in terms of the best practices, I'm not sure that there really are um, any examples that really jump out at me within the Canadian context. I think, um, you know, I think definitely in other jurisdictions where this legislation has um, been put in place. I think we can look to how those industries have responded, um, but I can't give any kind of example of a Canadian company uh, at this point that can shine a light on their best practices. Great, thanks, Kelly. I mean, that kind of leaves me leaves me quite nicely into that the, another question that was asked, and that is about what's happening in other jurisdictions. So uh, the question is: Are there good practices or lessons learned? that companies can apply based on the experience of com companies and countries with um, similar to our proposed transparency legislation. Um, the two examples here are the UK and the Australia Modern Slavery Acts. Um, and so are there any mo modalities for information exchange between companies operating in these contexts to share such practices and lessons? So um, I think of, of uh, Malin or, and or Catherine, given your sort of international sort of um, uh, uh, perspective, 
Uh, do you see any of this happening where, where um, there's more sharing of information uh, where, where this legislation is already in place? Well, I think definitely from our engagement with the Danish fashion and textile industry, um, there um, there was really a very kind of open and honest uh, approach about um, uh, about the challenges across the um, across the value chain, um, and also you know we we don't in Denmark have our own. Um, uh, dedicated Modern Slavery Act. Um, we are still waiting for the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation at EU level to come through. We do have reporting requirements on sustainability and including human rights specifically. Um, and um, that came up several times in the discussions, but in a quite kind of open and fair uh, manner. Um, and with the same kind of notion that companies were increasingly understanding that um, that they needed to move away from this kind of compliance tick box exercise towards a kind of more open um, engagement around um, the issues and how they're dealing with them. And that's what's expected in terms of, of exercising human rights due diligence. Great, thanks, Catherine. Maylin, anything to add there? And maybe I can say that, I mean, I don't exactly know how it is sort of uh, at the country level in, in the UK and Australia, but I can see that that I'm, I mentioned it before that we at the center for the last 10 years, we've had what we call a child rights and business working group with companies that come together and under Chatham house rules uh, discuss key issues around this. Very often it comes back to child labor uh, because that's very often the entry point in all sorts of discussions around human rights uh, in supply chains. And when we started off, I think we had seven companies uh, joining. Now we're close to 30 companies, uh, all big international brands from various jurisdictions. And they all come together because they have an interest to discuss and to share information. So I think what Catherine mentioned that we see more transparency around these issues. And we really, uh, encourage companies to share because we think that companies that are identifying, for example, child labor, take action, do remediation and follow up. Those are the ones that are really following the uh, HRDD sort of circle or whatever we call it. Those that are sourcing from high risk countries and never say that they have any problems with child labor, then we start to become suspicious, right? So sharing, and we can also see in our working group that we are, companies are more willing also to share because we do, when we, sorry, when we identify child labor and child labor clusters, for example, in, in certain countries, then we come together, we, we start asking the companies, do you also source from this area? Do you have suppliers? And companies are now much more willing to share that kind of information that, yes, okay, because we can show it on the map, for example. Here we had 60 kids in a mill. Uh, and then the companies come together and say, yeah, we have also suppliers there and we also have suppliers there. Maybe it's also, maybe we are also part of sourcing from that bill and so forth. And that didn't happen five years ago, I must say. So there is an increased sort of appetite for being transparent and for sharing at, at various levels, which I think it's, it's really good. No, that's, uh, um, so it's good to hear good news. Um, and that is, and, and hopefully that, that, can get, that can be a trend uh, as we move forward. Um, there's a question here, and it, it really, I guess it would be to the core and to, to Kelly. It's, it's uh, focused on Canada and um, advocating for um, uh, mandatory uh, human rights and environmental due diligence legislation, Bill uh, C-262. Um, so I, I think I can respond to that, and I'll ask Kelly to. But then, um, you know, maybe we can go back to Malin and uh, Catherine about just uh, mandatory uh, human rights due diligence uh, legislation generally. So I just want to say from the core's perspective that we do and we have in the past um, supported and continue to support um, the need for mandatory um, um, human rights and environmental due diligence. Um, um, we're seeing that shift. Uh, Catherine mentioned that it's not just transparency legislation that we're seeing in other countries. We're seeing um, human rights due diligence uh, legislation. It's already been passed in France and Germany, um, and it's you know being considered in Norway, Netherlands, and the EU. And that's just you know some of the countries. So it's there's, it's being discussed here in Canada. Uh, private member bill C two sixty two is is there. So yes, uh, definitely um, we support it as the core uh, because moving beyond voluntary compliance. Um, is an important practical step. And it's a clear signal, I think, of, of Canada's and any other country that does it, of their commitment to protecting human rights 
um, around the world. So that's uh, from the core's perspective. I don't know, Kelly, if you want to sort of say anything from Fashion Takes Action um, or your take on mandatory human rights, environmental due diligence. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my I, I completely agree with everything that you said. I think my only comment would be more about um, S211 um, and the fact that, you know, SMEs are um, exempt um, and, you know, the bulk of our industry here are SMEs. So just something that I wanted to, to point out um, around that legislation, but otherwise, you know, supporting um, for, in all other areas. <laughs> Yeah. Danielle, I think there's uh, just uh, jumping off of uh, Kelly's um, um, statement there about S211, I think there's there's an, um, an interesting um, fact from um, how many companies would fall under under that. Yeah, of the 10 that we interviewed, um, only one would actually be captured by S211. So I think that's quite telling. Yeah. So thanks for, for uh, flagging that, Kelly. That's it's an important uh, a point. Um, I, either Malin or, or Catherine on um, mandatory due diligence and um, the importance of yeah, I think um, I would say that um, that of course you know what we're seeing at the EU level and also at, within these countries you mentioned as well, um, Sherry is also that um, the the scope of application is also the larger companies. So uh, uh, you know that that is a part of the challenge, but in a way, because of the way that it's currently being um, being scoped, it would apply across the full. Uh, value chain. So even if you as a garment company aren't uh, directly um, uh, fall directly under uh, the legislation, you will still be a part of potentially the supply chain or value chain of a company that would fall under. And that could include both um, larger uh, brands. If you're, for example, a, a brand um, uh, that uh, gets a logo on it from another company that might be a part of the legislation that might be a part of this uh, upcoming due diligence uh, requirement. So there may be a certain need for that company who is using your uh, garment company to brand uh, themselves to um, to make sure that that part of their uh, activities um, isn't uh, connected to human rights abuses or child labor, et cetera. So you may still be uh, impacted by it as a, um, as a provider um, to companies that the legislation falls under. Um, so, so even though it doesn't impact you directly, it may impact you uh, indirectly um, as a part of the value chain of the companies that the legislation does cover. Um, then I think it just, you know, creates a change of of um, of mindset more generally within the market around uh, human rights and human rights due diligence. And uh, hopefully, even though you're not di directly or indirectly impacted uh, by the or fall directly or indirectly under the the proposed legislation, um, you would still uh, uh, experience the shift in uh, the market in terms of you know the the expectations on the due diligence and uh, and communication around uh, human rights challenges and impacts um, and we're already seeing that shift now as Marilyn also pointed out um, in in the fact that companies are already now becoming more transparent more clear uh, wanting to discuss these challenges etc um, so it's not just uh, due to the fact that they will potentially fall under the legislation, but also because um, that is the trajectory that we're seeing society move towards. At least that's kind of my optimistic view of things. Great. I, I love optimism. So that, um, thank you for that that response. Um, Malin, anything on, on that? No, I think Catherine uh, ended on a very good optimistic note. Okay. Uh, so I think it covered it all, I think. Good. All right. Thanks. Now, um, very interesting question um, um, for the core, and I'm just going to read it. I'm going to ask for all the panelists sort of input on this. But the, the question is, what can the core play in coordinated collective action as a neutral party? Um, and so I've already mentioned, you know, when we were talking about collective action before that, you know, um, the core is already looking at a phase two, like we've made these findings. Um, we've got some some ideas of where the gaps are and where where learning needs to happen. Where where advice would be would be um, um, 
I hope appreciated. So what, so I just want to throw back to the, um, the panelists and just for the brainstorming and, and not, but just what, you know, how could the core, um, what are the options for us to, to engage in collective um, action? Mila, I'm looking at you, so I'm going to, I'm going to follow oh, you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to jump in, but go ahead, Mila. Sorry. No, go ahead, Kelly. Go, yeah, ahead. go ahead, Kelly. Sorry. Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Well, I was just going to mention that, you know, Fashion Takes Action and the core are partnering to hold a series of educational webinars this year for the Canadian industry so that they can gain a deeper understanding um, into these key areas. So I think, you know, uh, FTA really sees uh, ourselves being that sort of neutral party. So we'd be happy to um, work alongside the core and help it coordinate some of these collective action efforts as we are doing in other areas, as I mentioned, with circularity and with climate. So would definitely love to continue in that same spirit, but looking at more on the HRDD side. Great, thank you, Kelly. We, we value your partnership. Okay, no, but I think um, I think what you just mentioned, Kelly, I think that's great because I think also that the study gives a lot of, provides a lot of opportunities on, in sort of what, what can we do here and how can we also, how can the core and other partners in, in Canada support companies? Because we, we could see that many of them are not sure really what they are doing. They're doing something, but they are not really sure what it is. And it's not that they need to put it in exactly the right human rights box, right? But but I think that there are, you can create a lot of um, sort of under, better understanding and uh, uh, just by a few small things to do. And uh, as we have discussed also previously, that there are a number of tools out there, there are a number of guidelines, you don't have to start from scratch, but but you might, help the companies to hold their hands a little bit. Because when we start to work now with more smaller companies uh, that are coming to us just because of these uh, legislations, some of them feel totally overwhelmed and they feel they don't have anything in place. They don't know where to start because this is also very much linked to management structures, right? If you have a due diligence system, that's also linked to sort of the, the wider sort of both company culture, how do you do your business, but also how do you sort of monitor and how do you implement and, and sort of what are the, the, the guiding principles for that. So I think that that is, that is something for, for the core and, and the other partners to, to show companies step-by-step -step approach, right? Because no one will be able to do all of this in one. And then the, the risk is that nothing is being done because it's just too much, right? So you need to figure out what are the low hanging fruits? Where do we start? What do you have in place? And where do we go from that? So I think there are there are a lot of opportunities for sort of uh, collaboration that is pointed out in the study. Great, thanks, Milan. Catherine, anything to add there? No, uh, I think uh, my co-panelists said very well. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we're getting up to the end here. So I have one last question that I'm going to take, and I didn't catch all the all, did all the questions from the audience, so I apologize. Got most of them though, I think. Um, but just talking about rec um, what would we recommend to lawyers uh, to consider when advising clients on environmental um, due diligence and um, and whether to undergo human rights due diligence and what the difference is. Um, so, so it's an educational piece that they're they're asking for. Um, I'm. I, I'll maybe um, who who would like to go first on that. I can maybe share that I already sent through a few resources um, that Excellent. we've been working on on um, because we've been working together with the International Association of Impact Assessors to um, do a master class on human rights impact assessment and have also developed some materials to explain um, what are the differences between the different types of assessments, including both in terms of kind of teams and capacity and, uh, and knowledge, etc. So that I think could be an interesting interesting thing to look at. Of course, it looks specifically at the process of impact assessment, uh, more traditionally coming from the environmental social health impact assessment space and how human rights impact assessment uh, can be added to that or how human rights can be added to that process and what the criteria will be for that. But I think those learnings and parts of those elements, including those criteria, could also be applied uh, more broadly um, to uh, 
due diligence overall in terms of both um, the process and the content um, of the uh, of the due diligence. So in terms of process, uh, taking a human rights based approach and what that means in terms of both transparency and accountability, etc. Um, and then in terms of content, um, that really the benchmark is uh, international human rights, um, and um, and that should be at the core of it. So those I've already shared in, in the chat as an answer, um, but uh, but happy to elaborate if, if there's more detail needed. That's excellent. Thank you for putting those resources in. Uh, anyone else on, on that question? We're rounding up to the end. I would just say to jump in is that, um, you know, for those who, and I think many are aware, is that um, the UN General Assembly, um, um, uh, the, the, this summer um, passed a resolution that that the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is a un universal human right. So at, it is a human right in itself. So you know we should we should um, start trying to look at human rights and environment um, in, in with the same lens. Um, and a lot of these processes um, would could receive a lot of the same treatment. And uh, as as someone mentioned, that would help to address some of the fatigue. We're not doing two separate things. We are dealing with these um, together. So, all right. Well, um, I'm going to, as the moderator, um, and we're almost exactly on time, call an end to the audience questions. I really want to, like, we had, you know, over 20 questions here, and I just want to thank everybody uh, for um, for your active participation. Uh, it's, it's been great. Um, it's been a really rich discussion. Um, so I just want to. Um, before we totally end, um, ask our panelists um, to just to, to highlight one or two final points that they want to leave in, in your minds. Uh, so we'll keep it short. And again, I'm gonna do this alphabetically uh, by, by first name, which is uh, Catherine. Danielle, I am gonna ask you to make a few um, um, highlights there, Kelly and then Malin. Well, maybe um, if I'm speaking more directly to the Canadian garment sector, but also to gar uh, fashion and textile garment companies overall, uh, what I would say is, um, you know, take on the, the human rights classes, um, consider uh, your uh, activities with a human rights lens and ask ask questions, um, get to know your suppliers, your activities, your sub suppliers from a human rights perspective. That would kind of be my my key point. Thank you, Catherine. Danielle, so, what do you want to leave us with? Yeah, I, I think actually the way I'd like to end off is just to say thank you to the 10 companies that participated in the study. We, and I think, you know, I say this on behalf of the core, we very much appreciate your participation. Um, and I will mention too, we mentioned this in the study, but seven of the 10 companies consented to share their contact information with the core so that we could work further on these issues. And so I think that's really worth acknowledging and pointing out. And um, as Sherry's mentioned, we are envisioning a phase two. Um, so if there are Canadian companies that are interested um, in working with us on that, I certainly encourage them to, to reach out and contact us. So thank you. Thanks, Danielle. I'll go to Malin while Kelly uh, fixes uh, her technical issue. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think also the number of questions, and I've just had a quick look, is, is really showing that companies are and organizations are really on their toes now. They are they are eager to do something. I think it's really the momentum. And I think there are a few key things. I think Catherine mentioned a few of them. Ask the right questions, know your supply chain, try to get visibility into your supply chain. Think about your business practices, right? What are we doing that can exacerbate these risks that we know if we are sourcing from a high risk country where we have a lot of kids that are out of school, what business practices are important then for us to consider when we're sourcing from this country? And then seek advice. There's a lot of advice out there, a lot of reports, a lot of studies, a lot of tools, uh, and you're not alone. Everyone is, is, is working on these issues these days. So that, that's really good. Thank you. Great. Sorry about my uh, audio technique. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, they both Catherine and, and, and Malin <clears throat> covered it, but I would just say that, um, as it was mentioned in my introduction, we do have the sustainablefashiontoolkit.com um, has a number of, of those resources uh, on there. Um, and that really, I'm looking forward to collaborating with the core uh, 
on these series of uh, webinars to help really, um, you know, bring that level of understanding up um, that's really needed here in Canadian industry. So um, feel free to reach out to me or the core if you are out there in the audience and want to uh, get on that invite list. Great. Well, I just want to thank um, all of our panelists today uh, for joining us um, and having this rich discussion. What I've heard um, right from the, the beginning with the question that was about like, what can we do? Uh, you know, what about collective action? So it was a question to us, but it was sort of woven through everything all of the panelists said. Um, and so I'm, my takeaway from this is, is that we need, you know, um, a lot of collective action on all levels in order to address this and to make sure that that companies um, are acting responsibly, uh, that, they, that in, in, in turn they can be competitive, um, and that in, in turn that we, we are preventing and addressing human rights. Uh, so I think um, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with, uh, with you, um, the panelists, the, the Canadian garment sector, um, and other key stakeholders to strengthen responsible business conduct in the sec sector, and in particular to promote respect for um, children's rights. So I want to also thank face-to-face um, -face events, our interpreters, and last but not least, uh, you, our audience, for your incredibly lively participation and interest in the course study and these issues. Uh, I just wanna say uh, to end for more information about our study, uh, please do see the links in the chat and on our website. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day or evening or morning. <laughs>